right from the start I saw this as a business. I needed to make money to invest into the things that I wanted to do. I needed to make a lot more profit than had been the, the case um, previously and I embarked on probably eight strategies to achieve what, um, what I've achieved today. The most stunning conference that I've ever been to was in Narra Court in South Australia. 300 people attended that uh, two-day conference and it was run by an agronomist called Neil Kinsey. He was telling us how to have true soil fertility and all of the other benefits that come from, from that. The healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy humans. And I went there with an open mind and I just absorbed so much information and I was absolutely committed to go down the biological um, agriculture path. The first thing I did was stop using superphosphate. I uh, researched how superphosphate's made and how it reacts in the soil and why it locks up. And uh, I made a decision after that conference that I would never use superphosphate. And I started to use biological um, fertilizers. Um, Mineral, there's two aspects to this. The mineral fertilisers that you spread, the same as you would spread superphosphate, they're granulated, they've got about 11% phosphorus in them. I use reactive phosphate rock, or soft rock phosphate, or other forms of phosphorus, not uh, superphosphate. I've added to that a lot of trace elements over the years. I spend the same amount of money on my biological fertilisers as a traditional farmer would on superphosphate. That was the first decision I made and it's been spectacularly successful. Second thing I did was follow that up with a foliar spray. So in an average season um, I would spread the, uh, the mineral fertiliser in probably late February, early March. Then I would follow it up with a foliar spray at the time that I lock up the, uh, the hay paddocks. For me hay production is incredibly important. The hay paddocks are locked up in September. So I would go in with a foliar spray at 10 litres per hectare. I use that as a bit of a, a hay booster. And it's well known that foliar spraying is it's either four or seven times more effective than granular fertilisers. And I've had spectacular results with that regime. Another thing that I did was understand the importance of dung beetles. Uh, John Fian, who's well known, Canberra uh, ex-CSIRO scientist, prove to me the importance of dung beetles. So I've got the maximum number of cattle I've here, had here um, on my 240 hectares is about 210. It's a high stocking rate. Got up to 18 DSEs uh, under this program. The, uh, the dung burden on the property was very, very high. And the native dung beetles weren't capable of bearing that much dung. So we got some African dung beetles uh, through John Fian's influence and they have invaded the whole property within 24 hours of the cow pad appearing. There's dung beetles in it. Uh, within probably two days, nothing left of the, the, uh, the cow pad. All you can see is little piles of soil. So what dung beetles do is they bury nutrients um, deep into the soil profile. They get rid of the dung because you, know, you have less of a fly problem. And importantly, they make channels, big deep channels, which would go probably 200 mil into the soil. So therefore it aerates the soil and importantly I harvest more water because I've got millions of channels made by dung beetles and the water follows it down. So I'm harvesting water. Uh, look after your dung beetles. Not only the natives but the, uh, the introduced ones. An important part of what I figured out early was rotational grazing. Because these farms were managed by my elderly uncles, they didn't see the need to improve the profitability of the farm. They just had set stocking and the, the cows just roamed wherever they want. It was limited water points. One of the first things I did was adopt rotational grazing. However, I couldn't do that because I didn't have water in every paddock. It cost me a lot of money to get storage tanks. I've got about 120,000 litres of uh, stored water. And I've got solar pumps pumping up to the highest part of the farm and reticulating throughout the whole farm and I had to buy a second-hand ditch which the pipe and the troughs are a fantastic investment you know for long-term sustainability. The cows particularly um, in the height of summer are drinking high quality water instead of going into a dam and you know fouling the, the water. Rotational grazing was really important to me and it took me a while to get to that stage but I've achieved it. 
This is all about self-education. I go to field days and, and read a lot and ask a lot of questions. And one of the things that became obvious to me is that the, the things I've described so far will not give you the, the proper soil fertility status and the health status that I need you know, for my operation. One of the things I did was get a water medicator pump. I have two different types of water medication now. Because all my dams are fenced, and I've got water at the highest part of the property. Water uh, flows down and it goes through a, a medicator pump and it works on two metres of, of head pressure. We'll drive a pump, it's a single piston pump, no electricity at all, it's just water pressure, creates a venturi, sucks up some stock supplement, you know, which is high in whatever you want it to be. You know, name any major or minor element, it's, it depends on what you want to do. Prior to the carving season, I put apple cider vinegar uh, through my water medicator pump, which is a muscle relaxant and, and I've had significantly less problems with carving. I've got three of those pumps and I water medicate probably four times a year and uh, I've found that really successful. Uh, there's a lot of proprietary uh, products on the market. I don't like stock licks for various reasons. I think putting a, a loose powder into a bin and letting the cows just go up to it whenever they want to have a, a feed of extra phosphorus or calcium or magnesium or copper or zinc or whatever they need. They know what they need and they take that up. Another part of my operation you know, with the stock supplements is to have coarse sea salt available for them to, to take it up. This place was ploughed with a moldboard plough and there was no doubt at all that the, the soil was compacted. You can figure out your uh, aeration problems with chemistry by putting out uh, gypsum and lime. You can quicken the process by mechanical aeration. I purchased a mechanical aerator, which basically is a nine inch knife which pierces the soil. Generally, you've got four inches of friable soil, then you've got a hard pan, and then you've got beautiful soil underneath that. I guess it's like uh, a crowbar hitting a, a slab of concrete, it just fractures, and that's exactly what, this, what the mechanical aerators do. It's about three metres wide, and I used that in the early stages, and I had spectacular results with that. I've got a penetrometer here, and I could only push it in, you know, the first 100 mil. Paddocks that I've mechanically aerated, it just goes all the way down. So that was an important part of what I did early. But now I guess I achieve the same thing with uh, use of lime and biology, rotational grazing. And if anybody's considering a mechanical aerator, I would uh, recommend that highly. Weed control is important. There was too many weeds on this place, most of which were imported from South Africa. The worst being cape weed and, and onion grass. Early on, I used herbicides, and I haven't sprayed for five years. I'll have to do a little bit in the next year or two. Getting rid of weeds, it was important so that the, um, the desirable species could dominate. However, weeds are your friends. Nature just doesn't give you a weed just for the hell of it. It's, it's, nature hates bare ground, so that's why they give us cape weed here. It gives you dock you know, with a big, long tap root, which actually is trying to go through the, the hard pan and, and open it up and bring uh, elements up to the surface. And, and there's all sorts of weeds that are indicators of high or low fertility. So rather than just spraying everything, I uh, try and figure out um, you know, what are these you know, weeds trying to tell you. So weed control is important. I need, I was going to say 100% cover for 100% of the year, but I'll never achieve that. If I can get to 80 or 90% cover for 100% of the year, I would be really, really happy. The worst thing that, that happened here when I took over, there was too much bare ground. I've uh, certainly um, overcome that.